Okay. Welcome everyone to uh, Castle Pulse first mentor training series, module one, um, a conversation about consistency. My name is Colleen Myrie. I'm the Director of Registration Services here at the college. And with me is... Uh, I'm Sunita Jaglakar. I'm the Audiology Advisor and the Manager of Mentorship. Great. So um, before we start, we just kind of want to get a sense of who is uh, attending. So we're going to start with a polling question. So how many of you here today are currently mentoring A? Uh, B, have mentored in the past, C, haven't mentored yet, or D, are considering being a mentor. So we're just going to open up that poll. Yep, we'll just launch this polling question. And there you go. You should be able to see that question now. And, oh, sorry, now you should be able to see it and you can go ahead and enter your response. Okay, great, we can see some responses coming through. Just getting an idea of who our audience is today. Yes. Okay, so we can see that many of you have mentored in the past. Uh, about 20% of you are currently mentoring. Show the results. And yes, I'm just gonna manage the poll. I'm gonna close this poll now and share the results with you so you can see who, who is watching the presentation along with you. And so welcome, we do have um, uh, people with us today who haven't mentored yet or are considering being a mentor. So that's great. Okay. So um, as we go along in the webinar, um, I just want to point out that uh, there is a, a Q&A feature uh, to this um, webinar software. So you'll be able to um, text us your questions and uh, we, have um, some space in the webinar, uh, throughout the webinar to answer questions and as well as at the end of the webinar. I think, um, I think there's actually a questions box. Questions box, area. yeah. Depending on which device you're using, it might be in the, you know, the bottom right hand corner or somewhere on your screen, but there should be a box labeled questions where you can type in your questions. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, I guess we will try to get to as many questions as we can. If we are unable to answer your question during this webinar, we will um, definitely reach out to you after the webinar and answer your question then. Yes. Okay. So um, we will start by just outlining what the agenda will be for today. So um, the first thing is we'll discuss uh, consistency and what we mean by uh, that, as well as the purpose of mentorship. Uh, we'll be discussing the mentor's role and um, expectations, how to evaluate the mentee, and of course, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be answering your questions, and uh, after the uh, webinar is completed, we will send you a uh, survey. Okay. Okay, so uh, today, our session is called A Conversation About Consistency. Um, so we wanted to start by explaining or defining what we mean by consistency. So when we're talking about consistency, what we really mean is consistency in how mentors and mentees understand the purpose of mentorship, how mentors understand their role and the college's expectations, and how mentors evaluate the mentee. And so during our session today, these are the three areas that we hope to address or that we will address, um, because our hope is to bring consistency to these three areas. So we'd like to get into our first topic, which is the purpose of mentorship. And we are going to throw out another question to you all watching. 
So in your opinion, what is the most valuable aspect of a mentorship program? And I'm going to open up that poll for you. so that you can put in your responses. So is it A, to provide general guidance and support to initial registrants or mentees who are beginning their practice? Is it B, to teach the mentee about day-to-day -day clinical practice? Or is it C, to determine that a mentee meets minimum standards of practice and demonstrates the knowledge, skill, and judgment to continue their practice as a general Castlepo registrant? And so I think you should see some abbreviated um, options there on your screen. And we've got quite a few votes that have come through. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll. Maybe get up to 50%. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll just leave a few more moments uh, for people to put in what they think. Okay, so I'll share the results with you. All right, so really all of these aspects are valuable aspects. Um, mentorship is definitely about guidance and support for the initial registrant or the mentee. And it's also about sharing knowledge, which may be in the form of teaching, which we're going to talk uh, about a little later on as well. Um, but it's a lot more than that, as it's, uh, it's also that you as a mentor are making determinations about the mentee who is, is your colleague. You're making determinations about whether the mentee is meeting the minimum standards of practice that we are all expected to meet. And finally, at the end of the mentorship, you are making a high stakes uh, determination because you are deciding or determining whether the mentee, your colleague, um, has demonstrated the knowledge, skill, and judgment to continue on as a general Castlepo registrant. So C, in this case, uh, is um, obviously very important for the college, but all of these aspects are valuable. So moving on with uh, the purpose of mentorship, Colleen, I think you wanted to outline um, two other major purposes that mentorship serves for the college. Absolutely. Um, the first being public protection. Um, as you know, mentorship is a condition of the initial certificate of registration. So it allows um, the college to ensure, uh, one, that the mentee is, account is accountable and also that they are capable of being self-regulated. Um, it also provides an introduction to the college's quality assurance program. We kind of think of mentorship here at the college as a six-month peer assessment. Mm -hmm. It um, really introduces the mentee to the self-assessment tool, or um, as our new tool is the MSAD, which mm -hmm. is the mentor self-assessment tool. And uh, with that tool, it's to um, the mentee uh, reflects on their practice and also um, helps them maintain their competence to practice over the, the span of their career. And so it's like the same process we all go through as SLPs and audiologists when we fill out our self-assessment tools Absolutely. every year. Absolutely. Right. Um, throughout this uh, webinar, we will be um, uh, discussing scenarios. And uh, our first one is about the purpose of mentorship. And uh, we will follow um, our mentor, Olivia, mm -hmm. and our mentee, Zara, throughout these scenarios. So our first scenario, scenario uh, Olivia is mentoring Zara, and uh, who is a recent graduate and newly hired SLP. Zara is slowly adjusting to the workplace uh, setting, but lots of things are new to her. As a mentor, Olivia takes the lead in the relationship, setting up all meetings and driving all elements of Zara's learning during mentorship. Is this a problem? Interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> so um, looking at that scenario, we want to know what is the problem? Um, we, in 
considering this, uh, we want to talk about uh, who is accountable in the mentoring relationship and also what is self-regulation. Um, we feel both of those things go hand in hand. Mm -hmm, definitely. So um, first, um, we just want to define what we consider uh, is self-regulation. So self-regulation means that the regulatory function has been delegated to those who have the knowledge, skills, and judgment to do the job. And the granting of self-regulation acknowledges the profession's uh, registrants can govern themselves. So with okay. this great responsibility right. um, comes accountability. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Tamita, if you can talk a little bit about um, accountability from an audiologist perspective. Right, sure. Well, yeah, when I worked as an audiologist, um, I was accountable for my practice, you know, when I uh, became registered with Castle Poe and, and was able to practice in Ontario. Um, a person who is accountable is completely responsible for what they do and must be able to give satisfactory reasons for their actions. So in this scenario with the mentor and the mentee, um, Zara, who is our mentee, she is accountable for her actions and clinical decisions. And as you were saying, Colleen, this idea of being accountable or accountability, it's a large part of what being self-regulated means. Um, in fact, I know when we've been discussing that, we sort of see accountability and self-regulation as sort of intrinsically linked. You know, they, they sort of are, are very connected. So if I think about when I practiced as an audiologist, um, in the first couple years of my practice, I mostly did assessments and, and made some hearing aid fittings. But in the second, third, fourth years of my practice, I started to do some research and some vestibular testing and then cochlear implants. So what accountability means is that we are self-regulated and we're maintaining our competence to practice in the profession. What that means when you're accountable is that you monitor your performance by reflecting on your practice. So I needed to reflect on my practice and figure out, do I need to learn something because my practice is changing? Uh, what knowledge, skill and judgment do I need to gain to remain competent in my practice as an audiologist? Mm -hmm. And of course, it's the same for SLPs. Part of accountability is also interpreting your performance. So acknowledging what you need to learn, if there are new areas of practice you're getting into, um, if things are changing in your practice setting, different technology, different record keeping system, then you might find that there are certain standards where you need to do some learning. So interpreting your performance, acknowledging what you need to learn, and then deciding how you will learn it and how you will incorporate that learning in your practice. So for me, it was doing some uh, in-person training, it was shadowing my colleagues, reading some articles and so on. And part of accountability or being accountable is doing something, initiating action. So I would come up with my learning goals for that year and then I would complete the learning necessary to achieve uh, the goals. And I know this is what we all do um, every year as, as registrants of Castle Poe. It's part of what we're expected to do as, as part of our accountability and part of uh, being self-regulated health professionals. So linking it back to our scenario, during the mentorship period, we want Zara to understand these things. It really is the purpose of the mentorship period for her to understand accountability and, and what it means to be self-regulated. So we want Zara to understand that she is accountable for her practice, that she has a duty to practice in the best interests of her patients, which means meeting standards of practice and other regulatory requirements. She is responsible for her own learning and for developing and maintaining her competence. And we want her to understand that this is what self-regulated health professionals are required and expected to do. So I guess the question is, what can Olivia do as the mentor? Because in our scenario, Olivia is sort of taking the lead for Zara. Yeah. So, so um, when Olivia takes the lead as the mentor, uh, Zara does not have the opportunity to learn and demonstrate her understanding of self-regulation and her accountability as a practicing SLP or audiologist. 
So the question is, what uh, would help Zara understand the purpose better? Mm -hmm. And how can Zara or Olivia support Zara? Right. So um, as a mentor, Olivia can encourage Zara to take the lead in every aspect of her mentorship, recognize and remind Zara of her accountability, motivate Zara to critically evaluate her uh, competence and how she is performing to meet standards, and also support Zara to meet professional goals, to improve her competence and to meet standards. Right. Encourage, recognize, motivate, support. Exactly. Okay. So I think we've reached the first uh, time when we can look at what questions we have. So yeah, I'll just open up the questions and see if we have any that have come through. Okay, so uh, we should have mentioned that the the slides and the presentation, recording of the presentation will be available uh, on the website within a week after today's date. Mm -hmm. um, the slides are actually a handout in the presentation. So if you look on your screen, you should see the slide deck uh, there as a PDF as part of a handout. But uh, everything is going to be posted on the website after the presentation, including the slides and the recording. So we did have a lot of questions that came through about that. Mm -hmm. If you're having any technical uh, difficulties, you can try uh, logging out and logging back in. Also, our office coordinator can help you if you, um, or she is available. You don't need to be taking uh, any notes necessarily because the slide deck will be available. Yeah, it sits that audio sometimes lost. I'm wondering. Okay, hopefully the audio connection is uh, stable. But um, so I think those are all the questions that we've had come through so far. And we'll be stopping to look at the questions intermittently. So if anybody has any other specific questions, we will get to those. Absolutely. I'm just going to have a look at our audio connection. And it looks good from our end. So we'll continue on with the presentation. OK. So I think we're moving in now to the second uh, sort of topic that we'd like to cover today, which is the mentor's role and expectations. And so we're going to look at another scenario to um, sort of explore this topic area. Mm -hmm. So in this scenario, um, we're talking about Zara, our mentee. So part of Zara's job description is to conduct fluency assessments. And Zara tells Olivia, her mentor, that during her clinical placements as a student in university, she watched her supervisors conduct fluency assessments. However, she hasn't done many herself and isn't that familiar with the process. So as a mentor in this situation, how can Olivia help Zara? So we're actually going to put this out to you as a question. And I'll read through the options first before I launch the question. Um, so how can Olivia, our mentor, help Zara, the mentee? Can she A, teach Zara how to conduct the assessments and monitor her work in this area? B, review the practice standards for assessment with Zara and discuss their importance with respect to fluency assessments? C, help Zara develop a learning goal and guide her to resources to help her gain the knowledge, skill, and judgment that she needs. D, discuss clinical cases to help Zara talk through the process and relate to the standards of practice. Or E, all of the above. So now I will launch that polling question. And you should see those uh, responses sort of abbreviated on your screen. And we'll just give everyone about 20 to 30 seconds to respond. Slowly but surely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People are putting in. Okay. 
Okay. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll close that poll and we'll share the results with you. And as you can see, the majority of those of you here with us today said that D or E was the answer. And yes, it's true. Um, <laughs> all of these uh, things are you know, possible things that you as a mentor can do to help uh, the mentee. Um, so that was that was great. Mm -hmm. That's that's where we were headed. But we do want to give you some clear information on what Castle Pose expectations are of mentors. So I'll just go through uh, those with you. So basically, as mentors, um, you are helping the mentee identify the barriers in their practice. So let's take record keeping uh, record keeping standards for as as an example. If you as a mentor were seeing that your mentee is not meeting a particular standard of practice for record keeping, then your role as a mentor is to help the mentee figure out why they're not meeting that standard. What's the barrier? So is it that there's time pressure, that there's a time constraint or a time management issue? Is it that the mentee actually doesn't understand that they're supposed to be documenting something that is a standard of practice, so they need to do some learning? Is it that the mentee doesn't know how to use the record keeping technology in the workplace, so they need to develop some skills? Um, it's related to, you know, they, they don't have as much experience. So as a mentor, you're helping the mentee identify those barriers, and you're also uh, discussing clinical cases or encouraging the discussion of clinical cases to help the mentee think through uh, their practice and discuss their clinical practice with you. And then because you are the mentor, more experienced uh, colleague of the mentee, you are relating things back to the minimum standards that we're expected to meet. So next as a mentor, you're helping the mentee generate solutions to overcome that barrier that, that hopefully they're able to identify themselves. So you're helping the mentee problem solve on how they can improve. Um, you may help the mentee develop their learning goals for their practice. And of course, you're a good role model for the mentee um, in the workplace. And finally, as a mentor, you're keeping yourself available as a resource for the mentee. So if you know of good opportunities uh, for the mentee in terms of learning, you can guide them to those learning opportunities. It could be shadowing a colleague. Um, it could be in-person or online courses, artic articles, maybe particular Castle Poe documents that they could review. So in terms of what the college expects of, of a mentor for Castle Poe, these are uh, the expectations. So as mentors, um, you are helping the mentee become an information seeker and a lifelong learner. Um, because as we were talking about earlier, that's the accountability that we have, that we are responsible for maintaining our skills. And so we want the mentee to learn this and you as a mentor are supporting them to learn these ideas. So you're supporting and guiding the mentee, you're acting as a sounding board, you are professional colleagues. And when I speak to mentors and mentees, um, mentors tell me that they learn so much from the mentee because the mentee has just come out of university. Uh, and so they have maybe some new information that the mentor may not know as much about. But obviously the mentee is learning so much from you as their more experienced colleague because they don't have as much experience practicing as an SLP or audiologist. So as a mentor, you're coaching and advising, and you're a role model leading by example. We wanted to talk a little bit about what mentors are actually not doing, and that's mentors are not supervisors, so you are not supervising the mentee. And because you're not supervising, you're not ultimately responsible for the mentee's clinical activities or clinical decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think we wanted to spend a bit more time on this, Colleen, because um, it is a question that we do get from mentors and mentees. Yeah, I guess in mentorship, the mentee is in charge of their own learning, 
while um, in supervision, uh, it's the supervisor that directs the learning and the instruction. So we mm -hmm. kind of wanted to have that distinction in there. It's, you know, that whole piece about being accountable and um, making the decision on um, what you're going to learn and how you're going to fill gaps when you are missing some education or right. knowledge. And I guess when the mentees were students, which many times is not, you know, long ago, they begin their jobs, they were supervised as students. Yes. So that was a different thing. Now that they are uh, registrants of the college, um, they have a different responsibility. Yeah, we do yeah. expect um, more of the registrant than we do of the student. The student, um, the supervisor in that relationship is ultimately accountable for right. um, what that student does. Right. Whereas, um, as we said before, the mentee is responsible for all the care that they give. Right. It's an important distinction mm -hmm. for sure. I know another question we get is related to teaching, that mentors are wondering, are they the ones that are responsible for teaching the mentee, you know, clinical skills or things that they may need to know when they start? When the mentee starts working. Sure, so um, a mentor absolutely may teach the mentee new skills as part of their learning and mentorship. However, the mentors are not required to teach clinical skills or to constantly monitor a mentee's practice. Um, the mentee's role should be viewed or the mentor's role should be viewed as um, an experienced consultant and trusted advisor who will coach the mentee in understanding and applying the college's practice standards as well as principles of developing, um, sorry, principles for developing sound clinical judgment. Right. So the, um, again, it is the mentee who should be directing their learning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know that, um, you know, it, the mentors, they could be the ones who end up teaching the mentee if that's how things work out. Mm -hmm. um, but the mentee is obviously also able to learn from other colleagues. Exactly. You know, they could be shadowing other colleagues and learning particular skills. The mentor's responsibility or the main responsibility that you are taking on as a mentor is um, that you are going to do that evaluation of the mentee on the minimum practice standards that are in that mentorship self-assessment tool. So I think we wanted to talk about what mentors are actually required to yeah. do. So right. um, of course we require mentors to uh, directly observe the mentee's practice and also to engage with the mentee in order to evaluate if they meet CASPL's minimum standards of practice. Mm -hmm. So during that six month mentorship period, mentors must provide the 48 hours of mentored guidance to the mentee. So um, that's the two hours per week or eight hours per month. And um, the college does expect you to use both direct and indirect guidance. Um, both are needed in order to make that assessment about the mentee later on. Right. So direct guidance would be like being in the room with the mentee mm -hmm. while they see patients or watching a, a video recorded session, of course, with appropriate consent from the patient. Mm -hmm. And then indirect guidance would be comments in the mentorship self-assessment tool from the mentor to the mentee about their evidence or how they're meeting or you know understanding standards or email correspondence or phone correspondence mm -hmm. okay great so that uh, brings us to our next uh, time for questions so i will go to the questions and see if we've had anything come through Oh, I just need to pop that out. Okay. Okay, that the one about does not work with you. Yeah, I'll just see. Okay, so we have um, a question that's come through that says, 
can you mentor someone who does not work with you? I've had someone reach out to me to see if I can mentor her, but we won't be working for the same company. Yeah. So um, I guess the mentorship program does um, allow for what we consider distance mentorship. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to work uh, for the same company. However, there has to be an understanding with that person's employer that um, you will um, have to have some access to um, patient, records. patient records and things of that nature. So, um, of course, the men mentee must have that discussion with their employer mm -hmm. and understand that this is something that uh, you will be reviewing and um, so that there is that cooperation there. But right. definitely it can happen and our new MSAT is great for uh, facilitating mm -hmm. um, this uh, distance mentorship. Yeah, because as you'll see, the MSAT allows for the mentee and the mentor to log in separately from wherever they are, mm -hmm. whether they're in the same workplace or at different workplaces, and the mentee can uh, enter comments about how they understand the standards, they can upload their evidence files, and the mentor from another location can log in and see what the mentee has said about their, uh, you know, how they're meeting the standards and look at their evidence, send comments back. So it does help to facilitate that mentorship over a distance if you're not with the mentee in the same workplace. Yeah. But yeah, the employer does need to be brought into the loop to make sure yeah. that that's going to work out. And I mean, there can be, um, if need be, uh, redaction by the mentee of certain um, information information on the record, but uh, it's easier if you have that cooperation where um, the employer knows, knows that you'll be looking at records yeah. yeah, as part of the requirements for the mentorship. I think we have a couple quick questions we could do. So one question is, can you have more than one mentee at a time? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, as long as you feel as the Castle Poe mentor that you're able to give, you know, the the mentored guidance hours and the time that's required for you to be able to evaluate the mentee um, the way that we're, we're talking about today. Exactly. So as the mentor, you are taking that responsibility of, you know, doing the mentorship self-assessment tool, submitting a midterm and a final report and spending those 48 hours with the mentee. So as long as you can do that uh, with multiple mentees, then you can have more than one mentee. Um, so I think the other questions we can, time. I think we'll move on from here. And please don't be concerned if uh, we didn't get to your question because we will be capturing all the questions and getting back to you individually. Yes. But for the sake of time, I think we will continue on to our next section. So our next section is how to evaluate. So, so um, we are taking you to scenario. another scenario, uh, which will il illustrate how to evaluate or the concepts of evaluation. Mm -hmm. So Olivia is uh, completing Zara's uh, midterm evaluation and considers the following practice standards. Uh, 2.4, I use intervention procedures that are appropriate to the patient's abilities. And 4.1, I use language that is appropriate to the age and cognitive abilities of the patient to facilitate comprehension and participation. So Olivia thinks that Zara is making good progress, but feels that there is still room for improvement in these areas. Um, she isn't sure how to rate Zara using the scale in the mentorship itself assessment tool, um, the MSAT, which includes the meets the standard, needs work to meet the standard, and also uh, not applicable. Right. Same uh, rating scale as in the self-assessment tool. Absolutely. Quality assurance self-assessment tool. So how can Olivia determine how to rate Zara? Okay. So um, as uh, Zara is, or Olivia is um, considering this, uh, um, she should note that the evaluation is a point in time evaluation and not looking into the future. Um, there are two evaluations that occur during mentorship. 
there is one at the midterm at three months, and then there's one at the final the final evaluation at six months. And um, all of this happens uh, through our new MSAT. Right. So um, the evaluations are done online now. And that's why we've got our mentor on the computer filling out their <laughs> exactly. MSAT. <laughs> so um, the mentor's evaluation, um, they do use their own professional judgment to determine um, the does the mentee de demonstrate a level of competence that is adequate for their uh, career stage and practice setting and also um, does the mentee demonstrate overall behavior that shows a commitment uh, to meeting standards and the skills to carry on as a self-regulated general registrant of CASAPO. So, right. you know, considering these things, um, we also wanted to bring um, into focus uh, some of the standards uh, that we mm -hmm. consider a little bit different than right. other standards. So, yeah. um, Samita, if you can yeah. talk about those. Definitely. Um, yes, yeah, so thinking back to the scenario we're looking at, our mentor had those two indicators that she was looking at and she wasn't sure how to rate the mentee. Mm -hmm. And for those, we would guide the mentors to consider these uh, things that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. So career stage, practice setting, and overall behavior of the mentee. But um, we did want to share some important information with you that's new actually in mentorship. Mm -hmm. So. In the mentorship self-assessment tool, the MSAT, we have something called red flag indicators. And these are indicators that we looked at um, closely as we were making our, uh, doing our development of the mentorship program. And in the MSAT, there are seven red flag indicators. And when you log into the MSAT, you'll be able to tell which, one, which ones are the red flags because they do have a little red flag symbol beside them. So these red flag indicators are standards, standard minimum standards of practice that the college expects a mentee to meet early in their practice. And these red flag indicators are measured by the midterm evaluation. So if these indicators are not met, the red flag indicators, then those particular standards appear in the mentor's midterm report in the MSAT for a comment from the mentor. And the mentee must address these standards through a learning goal. Yeah. So we wanted to go through with you which uh, standards are the red flag standards. And as you'll see, these standards are quite evident and clear cut standards. So the first one is I maintain records which accurately reflect the services provided. I perform the controlled act of prescribing a hearing aid for a hearing impaired person. I follow health and safety procedures and practices. I obtain and document consent for all intervention plans or courses of action. I obtain and document consent to collect, use, retain, and disclose personal health information. I maintain patient confidentiality at all times. And I accurately communicate my professional credentials to my patients and others. So as you'll see, these are very evident, clear cut standards in the sense that you either meet these minimum standards or you don't. It's easier, uh, I would say, as mentors in, in your role as a mentor, it's uh, less gray in terms of determining the rating for a mentee on whether they meet these indicators or not. Yeah. And we, again, expect the mentee to meet these standards early in their practice. But then there are other uh, standards or indicators in the self-assessment tool or the MSAT that are more contextual and it can be a matter of degree. So those are like those indicators in our scenario. And here are here's another example. Um, 2.3, I use intervention procedures based on current knowledge, incorporating evidence-based research and advances in technology. Well, this is an example of a standard of practice that is really an ongoing point of learning. Yeah. You know, because um, current knowledge is changing. Evidence-based research is, is, is always changing. Technology is always changing. So every year, that's why we look at this standard and we have to reflect. 
and think, do I meet this or not? Or is there something that I need to learn to bring my knowledge, skill, and judgment up to the basic level that is required? So for these types of indicators, and I'll bring up a few more that are like this, this is where you as a mentor are using your judgment and considering the mentee's uh, career stage, the practice setting that they're working in, and their overall behavior um, towards meeting these standards. And then you're making your determination based on those things. Mm -hmm. So apart from those red flag indicators we reviewed, it is acceptable for the mentee to receive a needs work rating at the midterm. Um, the standards that receive a needs work rating can be addressed with learning goals. However, again, those red flag indicators must be prioritized for the learning goals. And the ultimate goal is that the mentee will meet all the standards by the end of the mentorship period. But meeting standards is obviously not finite, as we just discussed. Mm -hmm. Many of those standards are ongoing points of learning and development over the career span. And so that's another reason why it's important that the mentee go through this exercise and learn this, because for the rest of their careers as a Castlepo registrant, they will expect be expected to do this exercise as part of their uh, responsibilities being a, a regulated health professional. Yes. So we also wanted to give you some concrete guidance on how you can assign your ratings as a mentor. And so this table is from the uh, mentorship program guidelines. And it's, it's sort of, a, it's telling you when you'll give that rating of meets the standard versus needs work to meet the standard. So a rating of meets the standard would be given uh, by you as a mentor if you saw that the standard is consistently met by the mentee um, their evidence is, is well prepared and they've been able to show you uh, that they understand the standard and that they're, they have documented, you know, the ways that they're meeting that standard. Um, you'd also give a meets the standard rating if the mentee is independently recognizing um, the areas where they need to improve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're coming to you or they're seeking feedback from colleagues, they're asking questions, and they're showing overall behavior that they want to improve their practice, they want to meet those minimum standards, and they're asking some good questions. You would give the rating of needs work to meet the standard uh, if you saw that, you know, the standard is not being met on a consistent basis, if the mentee has incomplete evidence or the evidence needs improvement, if the mentee is not independently recognizing the areas where they need to improve, and if you've made attempts to uh, improve uh, the mentee's understanding and compliance with a standard and that has not been effective, then you might be giving them the needs work rating. And finally, if the mentee just uh, doesn't, it doesn't seem like they're putting effort into meeting the standards, mm -hmm. then that's when you might as a mentor consider giving them that needs work rating. So, um, Colleen, I know that this is a question we do get from mentors from time to time. Mm -hmm. So, should a mentor be concerned if the mentee is getting lots of needs work ratings at the midterm? Uh, so, we would say it depends. Mm -hmm. So, um, what the mentor should consider, and it's to what degree the mentor is not meeting the standard or just not getting it. Or the mentee. The mentee, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and. Is the standard is it a standard uh, where the mentee uh, can improve over time, or is it a red flag, clear cut standard where there is urgency to address it? Uh, can the behavior be remediated? Right. So um, there are strategies that can be considered uh, by the mentee to help the uh, or the mentor to help the mentee improve, uh, such as uh, set in place a plan to improve, uh, help the mentee set specific goals and track their progress, ensure that red flag indicators are addressed immediately. Right. So I think we've reached another point where we can take some questions. And so we can spend, I think, about maybe three minutes looking at some questions. Okay. 
just scrolling through. We're just scrolling through and having a look at the questions. <laughs> okay. So we do have quite a few questions that have come through and um, we may not be able to get to all of them. Um, I'm thinking that maybe we can look at a, a question that says, what if the mentor is not comfortable overseeing the other work site because it is a different patient population and there isn't access to that patient? Um, so I know I've uh, had this question before where uh, you know, in mentorship right now, there can only be one designated mentor. Mm -hmm. Multiple, we don't, there cannot be more than one mentor or multiple mentors. It's one designated mentor that takes on that role and responsibility of evaluating the mentee, doing the MSAT, completing the reports, etc., providing the guidance. If the mentee has multiple jobs and they're working in another setting that the mentor doesn't have experience with, um, the mentor can still talk to the mentee about their practice in that setting and you know evaluate if they meet standards the mentor can also have a collaborator in that other practice setting so another slp or audiologist who can uh, do some of the guidance with the mentee we do expect the mentor to help you know to coordinate that with the mentee so the mentor has to be aware of who the collaborator is going to be and we ask the mentee to track their mentored guidance hours in that other setting. Mm -hmm. um, in the mentorship contract, we do have a collaborators form that we ask the mentee and the mentor to fill out and let us know at the college who the collaborator will be for the mentorship. Yeah. Because we do have criteria for mentors um, on the website and the, and the collaborators have to meet that criteria as well. Yeah. So I that kind of um, helps to fill the gap that you can see as a mentor that um, this person is there on site with that person and has um, the knowledge in that area to collaborate with you as the mentor who might not have the same level of knowledge. Right, right. So I know that there are more questions, um, just because we do have one more section to get through and we want to make sure we get through all the information. We're going to leave our questions for now, but please don't be concerned about that because as we said, we're going to look at all of the questions and get back to you individually. So I think we're moving to our last scenario. We're still talking about how to evaluate the mentee. Absolutely. So. Um... Zara is completing, or sorry, Olivia is completing Zara's final evaluation. And Olivia has some concerns that she discussed with Zara during the uh, midterm evaluation. Unfortunately, Olivia feels that little progress has been made since then. Yeah, so we're imagining now that the mentorship has happened, the guidance, you know, you've spent the time providing guidance to the mentee, you've done the midterm and all of that has happened, and now they've come to that final evaluation time yeah. point. So um, Olivia must answer the following high stakes question on the um, final evaluation, which says, uh, the mentee meets Castle Post professional practice standards, and I recommend the mentee for a general certificate of registration without any terms, conditions, or limitations. And that's just a yes or a no. Right. So based on her observation of Zara and discussions with Zara about her practice, Olivia has doubts about recommending Zara for a general certificate of registration without any terms, conditions, or limitations. Mm -hmm. So what should Olivia do? Okay. So um, in yes. this, this is another question that we do get, which um, is, you know, what should mentors do if they have doubts about a mentee's competence during the mentorship period? And um, what we would say is that um, these doubts could be due to the mentee consistently 
uh, not meeting the practice standards or the mentee is um, clinically not where you expect them to be at this stage. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think the the other question is then that is, uh, you know, what can Olivia do as the mentor in this scenario? Um, so as a mentor, obviously it would be important to discuss, uh, you know, your thoughts with the mentee. Um, where are the doubts, you know, that you have? Why do you have those particular doubts? Um, you can contact the college to discuss some options in this situation. And some examples of possible options would be that the mentorship period could be extended. And I know that I've spoken to a few mentors and what they say is if we had a few more weeks or, you know, a month or an, an, another couple of months, um, I think the mentee will be able to grasp those standards and meet them. And I'm not concerned about that, but we need a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a, a matter of a, a bit more time, then we can ex extend the mentorship. Another option is that the mentorship period can be repeated with a new mentor. Yeah. And that's, you know, uh, in some ways a clean slate, uh, a fresh set of eyes. And um, that is another option. Yeah. So, you, you know, as you as a mentor, um, if you feel that you know, you've done all that you can with this person. Um, it's fine to end the contract, provide your evaluations to the college, and then it's up to that mentee to then find another mentor to continue um, with another mentorship period. Right. If there's standards still at the end that they aren't meeting. Correct. Um, we wanted to um, highlight that we, uh, our college has a clinical reasoning tool, and this is a tool that could be used by uh, you as a mentor um, in that situation where, or to address that, the situation where a mentee is not clinically where they need to be. Um, the clinical reasoning tool was developed by the Quality Assurance Program here at Castlepo, and it is available on the website now as a resource. And basically what that tool is, is it's a method of evaluating a clinician's clinical reasoning through a guided conversation. Mm -hmm. um, that guided conversation helps to reveal why a clinician did what they did, um, you know, why they made the decisions that they made. And so it promotes that reflective practice that we want, uh, that we all are, are, are supposed to be doing and that we want our mentees to do. So in that scenario uh, where the mentee is not clinically where uh, you think they should be or where they need to be, you can use this tool and have that sort of uh, clinical reasoning conversation. It might be very helpful. So we've put the URL on the website where you can find the guide to the clinical reasoning tool and the guide explains you know, what the tool is, how you use it, and then the actual tool itself yeah. is what you would use when you're having that guided conversation with your mentee. Um, finally, uh, this is another question we do get from mentors as well, which is what should a mentor do if they give a needs work rating at the final evaluation, but overall they still feel they can recommend the mentee for general registration. So if this happens as, uh, for you as a mentor, then uh, you will be asked to provide an explanation and to put that needs work rating in context. So um, sometimes what I've seen mentors write is, you know, the mentee still has a few documents left to review related to their practice. However, the mentee has been, you know, putting efforts into reading these documents and has a plan and a goal in place to finish reading those in the next two months or, or something like that. So that type of comment then tells us that it's not something that you're, you know, concerned about as a mentor and that the mentee does have a plan in place to address that standard if they're getting a needs work rating. So in the uh, MSAT, there are mandatory comment boxes for the mentor to fill out, and this is where the mentor uh, should explain their evaluation, their ratings of the mentee. And mentors should explain why the mentee has received that needs work rating, and if the mentor has concerns about the mentee meeting the standard in the future. 
um, if there is a disconnect in in the report between what the mentor is saying and the ratings then we will contact you for some clarification um, the mentor's comments are also very helpful for the mentee moving forward because the mentee can take those comments and then use them towards a learning goal in their general uh, registrant uh, or general member SAT self-assessment tool in the next year. Okay, so I think um, we have covered our topics for today. Um, which were these three things. This is what our conversation about consistency was today. Yes. Um, and I think we do have about three minutes left uh, to do a, a few more questions before we wrap up. So we'll see what questions we can get to. Sorry, we're just having a look mm -hmm. at the questions there from. How do we access the MSAT? We'll be giving you information on how you can access the MSAT. Yeah. Okay, I'm just looking for a question. Do you see a particular one you'd like to address? Um, maybe the maternity leave question? Sure. Um, so can the mentor, um, can you mentor someone while you are on maternity leave from work? And um, the that um, can happen. However, uh, you would have to maintain your general certificate um, in order to mentor. So you cannot be a non-practicing member and mentor. So mm -hmm. um, definitely is something that can happen. Okay. Yeah, we, we do have some very good questions that have come through, but um, it, they may take a little bit more time to answer. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are uh, taking a pause here for a second. Um, maybe there's one quick one we can get and again please don't be concerned that we haven't gotten to your question because we can see all of the questions and we will mm -hmm. get back to you um, so the question is I would like to know how does a mentee get to choose a mentor does the Castlepo have any guidelines in this regard so basically it does fall on the mentee to figure out who their mentor is going to be yeah um, many times as the mentee is looking for their job, uh, they some you know they often know about mentorship. They've read the website uh, or they've listened to a presentation in university, so they know that they have to complete the mentorship. And they are talking to their employers and asking their employers if there is anyone there who can mentor them. If there isn't uh, anyone who is uh, eligible to mentor them at wherever they're going to work, then we at the college can provide a list of Castle Poe registrants who have agreed to being contacted for mentorship, mm -hmm. but we won't contact those people on the mentee's behalf. We do ask the mentee to contact those people on their own and talk about what the mentorship requirements are. Yeah, and I, you know, when you, the mentee does meet with a mentor to discuss whether or not um, they will uh, continue in a mentorship relationship, um, you know, they should take into account um, whether or not um, they feel uh, comfortable with this person and all of that. So, right. um, you know, it's it's a kind of a two-way street there. And if you both feel like um, this is something that uh, you want to continue with, you go forward. If, you know, it's 
you meet each other and it just, you don't click, mm -hmm. maybe you, you know, part ways and don't accept that mentorship. So right. it's, it's um, something that it's similar to when you're going on a job interview and you decide whether or not to accept a job or not. It's mm -hmm. a similar thing. Right. Okay. So I know that we've reached pretty much the end of our time for today. Um, so we wanted to, I think you were going to point them to the information on Absolutely. the website. Absolutely. So we have um, a bunch of resources already on our website to, to help um, both mentors and mentees. Um, the first being our um, mentorship program policies and procedures. Uh, they're available on our website um, at the link um, provided in this slide. Uh, on that page, you'll also find um, FAQs, um, the mentorship program guidelines, um, uh, contract uh, and the criteria for mentors. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a link to um, the MSAT uh, login page mm -hmm. and on that page as well we have some FAQs about the MSAT. Right and I'll just quickly address the question about the MSAT. When you uh, decide to be a mentor, when the mentorship contract is submitted, um, then you will get specific instructions from the college on how to log in and use that um, MSAT tool, yeah, mentorship self-assessment tool. And at this point, we just want to point out that there will be a survey that we'll ask you to um, complete. Um, it's actually three minutes, so it's, uh, it takes a little bit less time than five. And um, we will um, provide email that to you um, later today or um, tomorrow at the latest. Uh, mm -hmm. to give us feedback. So uh, your feedback is very valuable to us, so um, please do complete our survey. Yes, we will be using your feedback to inform, you know, future uh, trainings or sessions like this. Exactly. So um, we have a quote that we want to leave you with. Mentoring is to support and encourage people to manage their own learning in order that they may maximize their potential, develop their skills, improve their performance, and become the person that they want to be. Yes, <laughs> and uh, I think we, we just wanted to say to those of you listening who have been mentors in the past or who are currently mentoring, um, as you can see from the presentation today, the, the role that you take on is a very important one for our professions. And so we very much value um, the contribution that you're making as a Castle Poe mentor, which is one of the reasons why we want to put resources into the mentorship program. So thank you very much for joining us for the training today, and thank you very much for your contributions as a, a Castle Poe mentor. Great. So um, we leave you with um, some of our links to uh, some of our resources, such as our mentorship email, our Facebook page, our YouTube page, and um, our publication. So thank you again for uh, joining us in this session. Great, thank you. And we will get to the questions that we were not able to address um, during the session. Yes. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, everyone.